You can hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you for sure. Thank you. Best of luck. Thanks, you guys too. It'll be great. All right, so it's three o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna count down and then we will start the webinar so people will start being able to see you. So we'll start in five, four, three, two, one, and we're go. So good afternoon, everybody. I am delighted to welcome you to the National Integration Conference 2021, organized by the Immigrant Council of Ireland. My name is Angelisa Serpa, and I am a law graduate from Venezuela. Uh, I also have a master's degree in international law from Griffith College, and I am also a board member of Migrant Rights Center Ireland. Uh, I have a background and experience working in the area of employment integration. Today, we are on the third day of very interesting discussions in the areas of migration and integration in Ireland. And the workshop uh, that we are here today is about citizenship beyond the legal framework. Our agenda is gonna be 30 minutes of an open discussions among our panelists. And at the end, we will have 15 minutes for questions and answers from the audience. Uh, for the audience, you will see uh, bottom of your screen, you will find a Q&A box where you can leave your comments and questions. And if you have a question specifically directed to one of our panelists, please say so in your text. I just wanted to remind you to be uh, respectful and constructive in your comments and in your questions. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our panel of experts. Uh, first, we have Majo Rivas who is a human rights lawyer who holds a degree in law, in law from the Universidad Nacional de Asunción in Paraguay and a Master of Law from the University of Toronto. She was a Health Law Ethics Politic Fellow from the Canadian Institute of Health Research and an International Reproductive Health Law Fellow from the International Reproductive and Sexual Health Law Program. Maho has worked in the areas of women's rights, sexual and reproductive rights, migrant rights, disability rights and sustainable mobilities. We also have Bashir Otukoya, who is a law lecturer at Griffith College and a member of the Anti-Racism Committee in the Department of Justice. He's a PhD student in the UCD Sutherland School of Law and also in the UCD School of Politics and International Relations. He holds a Bachelor of Academic Law and a Bachelor of Law as well as an LLM in Public Law. And his current research focuses on citizenship, in particular exploring the political legal process of becoming an Irish citizenship by naturalization and its influence on the sociological idea of being Irish and a citizen of the European Union. Finally, we have Colin Lennon, who is an information and support service coordinator at the Immigrant Council of Ireland. He runs the information and referral service for the general public and the Citizenship Information Board. Colin graduated from National University of Ireland in Galway with a Bachelor of Law degree and from the University College of Cork with a Master's in Law. He has previously worked in the Free Legal Advice Center, as well as the Office of the Refugee Applications Commissioner as a legal officer. And prior to joining the Migrant Council, he worked as, uh, as an asylum uh, division in the KIOD Lions Solicitors. So to give a bit of a background on these topics, uh, the latest number in Ireland show that there are around six, 650,000 of migrants living in the country. However, between 2006 and 2018, only 145,000 approximately acquired Irish citizenship. So we have to question, why is that a discrepancy? Why there's such a gap? Uh, some migrants we know that do not qualify to apply. However, a large number still struggle to apply or do not apply due to the barriers that are currently in the system. Uh, 2020 was a year that posed many questions about citizenship and the legal framework and the policies around it. Uh, so the Economic and Social Research Institute published a new report analyzing barriers to citizenship. And some of the findings or some of the conclusions are that the legal framework needs a fundamental 
reform to, provi to provide a fair system. So today our panelists will be discussing how the current citizenship regulations and legal concept is proving to be a barrier for migrants and how it could be reformed to be a tool for integration instead. So now I just wanted to leave an open questions to the panelists, whoever wants to answer. Um, so why should citizenship matters and how is linked to integration in Ireland? Um, can I just start with, like, I always start with more, perhaps the very concrete ways in which citizenship affects people's lives. So one of the things is, for example, being able to vote. At this point, um, every person in this island can vote in local elections, but only Irish citizens can vote for a precedent or a referenda that might affect your reproductive rights, for example. Um, and uh, for the doll, the only people who can vote for those who represent us there are um, Irish citizens and uh, migrants from the UK. So that's one, like it's not just citizens who can vote in those. And then there's also the right to, for example, accessing, if, if a person isn't an Irish citizen, there are some restrictions in what type of employment, what a person can access. So for example, in public offices, and one thing that I think we talk a lot, and I think you talked earlier about barriers to employment, we want to see more people, more people of migrant backgrounds represented in the bodies that make decisions that matter to all of our lives. But if there is that very, there's that very, very clear barrier that if you're not a citizen and if you're not an EEA citizen, citizen in some cases, you can't access those spaces. So that is a very, very hard barrier there. Um, and, and it's almost, you know, many of these people who might be eligible for citizenship, but who face barriers, they're good enough to be parents of Irish citizens, to be married to Irish citizens, you know? Um, so uh, there are some barriers there. And that comes with, you know, when going on holidays, needing to apply for a visa, when every one year or every three years having to, if you're a non-EU migrant, having to go and queue in a GNIB, in a Garda station, where there are no seats and no toilets, and in many cases, what is a very undignified experience. So those are things that are reinforced. And that's only the practical point of view. And I think the other people would be able to supplement it more in terms of what it can mean for you and the safety. And I think the safety and belonging and feeling that maybe you can stand up for what you believe and not being afraid that that that's going to be um, hold up against you. So I think maybe those are some things I would add to that. Thank you, Maho. Certainly, like what Maho says there in terms of like the the, the permanency of, of of citizenship and what becoming and being accepted as a as an Irish citizen. What I find uh, through our information services that you know year on year that the difficulties and the barriers that uh, migrants face in terms of like renewing their residency impact and on their uh, their right to uh, employment in the state and it is just that peace of mind of that you know that long process it does take uh for you to you know first arrive in the state and you know secure your temporary residency uh with with always like the kind of i suppose the uh, the lens being focused on you know secure and a more permanent uh form of residency in the state and it is just that when you do become that, uh, you know, you you get your certificate of uh, of naturalization. It is that just peace of mind to know. Look, I you know little things like access and uh, having to to queue up at your local immigration office each each year uh, to renew your immigration status. Worried about you know traveling abroad for visas and like with all those extra barriers on it. It is absolutely certainly. Uh, that just security of, of, of residency and it is uh, reflected in all the, you know, the numerous calls we do get through our, our own service in the Immigrant Council. Uh, it is just that permanency effectively, Maho, you're correct. Okay, yeah. Mahir, do you have any comments on that question? Absolutely. Um, yeah, those are, those are important in terms of the legal protections that citizenship affords. I, I think those are by far the, uh, w without those rights, um, and I read, uh, has famously said, um, citizenship is the right to have rights. So if we don't have those legal protections, we don't really have citizenship. And I suppose that's kind of the understanding that we take from citizenship and the importance of it is those rights. But looking beyond the legal or rather the 
political or social political uh, or social legal uh, <laughs> complexities of citizenship. We can look at the sociological elements of it in terms of how we identify ourselves in terms of national identity and that sense of belonging in the same way that a birth certificate uh, uh, proclaims to a parent of a child that this child belongs to you. That's what our passport essentially does in the same way in the international plane. It governs who is responsible for us. Us Irish citizens, Ireland is responsible for us if we get into trouble in abroad. Uh, in terms of national protection, again, equality is very important. Uh, and equality in the sense of how, uh, in terms of the Black and Irish movement, for example, and I, uh, recognizing different um, ethnicities, different versions, I suppose, of Irishness. And I don't like the term the new Irish. Um, so I like to say the different versions of Irishness because Irishness is a developing, especially in the last three decades or so, uh, a, a developing phenomenon. And so identity is a huge part of citizenship. Let me put it into context. Uh, Zena Bolade, uh, the only black um, uh, media broadcaster in the uh, Irish public sphere, once questioned Nigerian or Irish, why can't I be both? And I often quote her article uh, because it's so significant, it's not just at that sociological and that psychological element of identity and the complexities that comes from that, but in the sense of the legal complexities as well, because our laws, Irish law, the 1956 Act, more specifically, Irish Nationality and Citizenship Act, tells us that you can't be both. <laughs> Let me give you a hypothetical situation, hypothetical because Ireland is a neutral country, but should in 20 years time from now, let's say, uh, uh, Ireland plays against Nigeria, uh, where I'm originally from, uh, and Ireland loses and we get angry and we say, okay, we are now at war with Nigeria. What is my citizenship? Well, I am both Nigerian and I'm both Irish, but where does my loyalty lie is the fundamental question behind that idea. And the answer to the question Irish or Nigerian simply uh, by virtue of section 19 of the 1956 Act tells me that I am Nigerian. I have no choice. Why? Because my citizenship can be revoked. And so the question is, am I actually a citizen? If unlike nationals, those uh, who acquired their citizenship through birth uh, or through ancestry, they're not at risk of losing their citizenship, but others who are naturalized citizens are at risk of losing their citizenship, even in that hypothetical situation. Section 19 tells us if at war with a country, uh, you are a national of that country, you will have your, you may, I should use the correct terminology, you may have your citizenship revoked. And you may think, oh, well, that's far fetched. That's never going to happen. This is an act that, this is a provision within an act since 1956. Only 10 revocations has occurred since that, well, has been documented since that time. Now we have a revocation panel being developed in light of social security, um, pu uh, public security uh, threats. Um, and so revocation is now possible, something we never thought of before. And so that goes into question, well, what is my citizenship in, in the sense of natural citizen, uh, naturalized citizenship? Because what essentially that act, uh, that section by virtue of revocation says is that you are not a full citizen. We are semi-citizens. Yes. That is semi-citizens we with super citizenship characteristics. And that's not what the constitution demands uh, as uh, article 40 of the constitution demands equality. Okay. And so can we really proclaim that we are citizens, uh, are equal citizens when one group, those nationals are not at risk of losing that citizenship. And so citizenship is so much, uh, so important in, in the context that Mario and Collins have already exp uh, explained, but in terms of our psychological understanding and, uh, and the impact that that plays in our social landscape. And I think it's very important that we start to have regard to what citizenship means, not just to us, but to our uh, national identity and starting to reconstruct that because our understanding of citizenship was uh, developed in the context of 
uh, Irish British relations. Yeah. Now that landscape has changed. Mm -hmm. Irish de uh, demography has changed, and therefore the laws surrounding citizen citizenship acquisition, what the constitution tells us, the laws surrounding who may become part of the Irish nation, needs to be reformed in light of uh, uh, the, the the change uh, that has occurred. And so, yeah, the, I think yeah, I've said a lot there, but. Those can, I add a, can I add a non-hypothetical that, that is very relevant to this case? And we don't even have to have a, a, an example of war or, or things like that. So right now, um, if we have a couple, so for example, myself and, and my, my own husband, who was, he was born Irish by birth. Um, I became naturalized if we were both to emigrate because, you know, it is, you know, emigration is something very natural in the history of Ireland. After seven years, if I don't register myself um, after seven seven years of living abroad I have the obligation of registering myself and making a declaration of my intention to retain Irish citizenship at an Irish dipl diplomatic mission with form five but he doesn't so when we do say that there you know we're all and, and this is something that was said in my own citizenship ceremony and I think it, it was very like I know too much to enjoy these things and I was like we're all equal and I was like wait a second we, we kind of are not Mm -hmm. There are different standards and the, the two people in the same situation, part of, you know, a marriage, we have some, we, we have different obligations and I could lose my own Irish citizenship. So that thing of we're all equal and we're all, all the same now that they say at the citizenship ceremonies, I'm always like, eh, you know, you should put an asterisk on that. Asterisk on that. Um, and those are things that, you know, it's not a hypothetical because people do emigrate uh, and that does happen and, and people move and, you know, we get over it. But there are rules here that hold us to different you know, standards and there are different consequences for people who are naturalized and then emigrate. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not a hypothetical at all there. Yeah. So what we can say is that in general, um, we are not in an equal system, even when becoming Irish citizens, Irish citizens by naturalization. And that obviously still impacts, even though before you apply for Irish citizenship, you, you felt that uh, your sense of belonging wasn't the same or there wasn't equal opportunities in the same way, even though when you actually become Irish um, by naturalizations, we are not in an equal system by, because we are migrants. So um, in, in that sense, Colin, I would like to uh, ask you in your experience uh, working with migrants uh, and providing information and support on this topic, what are the main issues that, that uh, these migrants face when applying for uh, Irish naturalization? Um, effectively, there's a, well, there's, a, there's a lot of issues in terms of the, the concept of naturalization uh, for uh, when making applications. Uh, what we find uh, through the service is even little things like access to documentation in order to, you know, to prove that you are your resident in the States is always something that is a can be a barrier in itself where individuals on the paper may qualify to apply for naturalization, having, you know, established residency in the state for a significant period of time. It is even that access to documentation or access to, access to identity documents uh, is another extra barrier that they find. Uh, for example, you know, everybody applying for naturalization needs to provide a certain amount of documentation to prove that they were living in, the, in Ireland over the last number of years. Um, that can be done generally speaking through bank statements, utility bills, um, rental agreements, et cetera, you know, your standard documents. Like, and what that requires is just a five years uh, previously that you establish all of these documents. There are certain cases where individuals, maybe um, migrant women who are victims of domestic violence, who've had to flee their, their abusive homes and who still have their residency and have that all sorted and are, are looking forward to applying for naturalization, find that barrier of, you know, utility bills, um, bank statements, not having access to uh, to those. We, you know, it's not that long uh, of in our own history uh, in Ireland in terms of, um, you know, uh, patriarchy in the fact that women mightn't have their names on utility bills. You know, the husband is in charge of all the bills. The husband is in charge of all the the bank statements and everything like that. And the, and women wouldn't even have the ability to have their name on a certain document. Uh, that in itself is a is a is a is a barrier uh, on a day to day basis. 
then going even further than that is identity documents um, where you would find uh, certain cohorts of individuals uh, wishing to apply for naturalization finding it very difficult to prove their identity in this state and um, when I go back to the point uh, on refugees, for example, so refugees having fled war or persecution have found themselves in Ireland and uh, qualifying to apply for naturalization only to find themselves with a barrier of having to show national passports. So um, to prove their identity as and to qualify for naturalization. It's an issue that we've seen in our service and others have seen it for, for a number of years now is refugees when making applications for naturalization are, are, told, are asked by the Department of Justice to provide a national passport, which is, you know, and we talk about, Bashir talked about, you know, revocation of Irish citizenship, even that in an example, a refugee who wanted to become an Irish citizen, having been accepted uh, through the relocation program or found their way individually here to the state, are then been told actually no you need to contact your own government to get a, a national passport to apply for naturalization which in itself is grounds to revoke their own refugee status and mm -hmm. um, and it is something that you know we've raised with the department and over the over the years and we are still to this day seeing individual cases of syrian refugees or trains saying please provide us with a national passport as a you know to obtain your your naturalization and um, identity documents are a huge issue in terms of uh, applying for naturalization another area would be children in the care system so migrant children who uh, who are either born in the state or found themselves here in ireland and um, applying you know and, and growing up through the system because our naturalization system is linked to the parents immigration status so um, minors in the state wouldn't have their own independent status they find themselves, uh, you know, kind of having a barrier to even access and naturalization until they turn the age of 18. Uh, I worked on a case during uh, about a year and a half ago of a young, um, young, young kid who's about 20 years old contacted us, who came to Ireland as a program refugee when he was three years old. Within a year, he was found, he was put into the care of the state uh, and he was in, in Tuzla care up until he was 18. And then because of the system that two social workers cannot apply for naturalization on behalf of, of children in the care system, found themselves having to apply for naturalization at 18 years old, having lived in this country since he was four, um, to find another barrier for him to access a naturalization because of a minor discrepancy in his birth certificate. And this is an, a, 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 an extreme case, but it is um, in order for him to go through the naturalization process, he was he had to contact the refugee um, section of the of the Department of Justice to get his refugee travel document amended, and they would not amend it until he did a DNA test to prove that he was the son of the the father who arrived in Ireland when he was four years old. He hadn't contacted his 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 father in in 15, uh, 15 years, uh, you know. Is successfully like he did not have to go through that system, but it just shows you the kind of barriers that are in place on a on a day to day basis for naturalization applications. They are the you know just some of the examples uh, of the kind of uh, the, the the restrictions there. While people who would you know qualify, and when we're not even talking about undocumented uh, migrants who you know grew up here without Im Im immigration status, but individuals who have a uh, you know, a pathway to citizenship, finding it difficult to, even in those scenarios. Yeah. Thank you, Colin. Uh, uh, about that, about undocumented migrants, I wanted to ask Maho, um, in her experience or, or her knowledge, can you give us an input on how recent policies on, on citizenship impact children uh, in Ireland or children born in Ireland? Yeah. Now, can I just add to what Colin was saying, you know, in terms of like, that's not the half of it. And we could be here talking for oh, two yeah. hours. Um, and the issue about refugees being asked for their passports has been brought to the attention repeatedly to immigration authorities. And we've said, look, it's not about those who can access us. It's for people who don't have access to advice and, and representation. But I, like I could rant that, about that for hours. Um, I think it, you know, there are so many, there are so many layers to the issues and the barriers for children. And I think Colin, Colin mentioned one of them. And one of them is that, 
in our current citizenship and naturalization process, children are not seen, well, in the, in the whole immigration process, actually, children are not seen as right holders in their own right. OK, so if, if a child um, if a child wants to become Irish and wants to become naturalized uh, for those who are not born Irish through, you know, Irish by birth, um, they have to either wait until one of their parents become Irish and then they can apply while they're under 18 and access um, and access citizenship before it starts being a barrier to access SUSE grants to access college um, it, and, and it's also much more affordable it's 200 euro versus 950 as soon as they turn 18 so that's one of the the very barriers so the child has to and, and a lot of parents don't necessarily know and aren't aware necessarily that that's a barrier for their children then they turn 18 and the problem can start so that's one very clear issue then we have the 27th amendment so like the 27th amendment with you know what that has created is has created this rule by which children who are born here and grow up in Ireland, and we could talk about the unfairness and the immorality of this for hours again, but children who know no other, no, no other place than Ireland who are born here and who cannot necessarily have a pathway. And you have the children of people who are undocumented, or you, know, you have the children of people who are documented, but who don't have the right stamp. Uh, that's, those are inverted commas. And what you can see behind me is I'm from Cork. That was omitted from my bio. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, you're fine. Um, so I guess that that's just another thing, you know, like you have people who are not children of undocumented people, but who just don't have the right stamp that would accrue them the, 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 the number of days it, to be Irish by birth when they're born here. Um, and, and there's, you know, and we could discuss the immorality and the unfairness of that, because even when we think about the context of the Irish who are undocumented in the US, we have to think about it. Um, being undocumented in the US only lasts one generation. The people who are undocumented who go there, when they have a child there, that child is an American citizen. And that has been a lifeline to many, many families in the US, including the Irish families who live, who leave Ireland for economic reasons, for many reasons. And we don't even have that here. So I think it's it's it, we we have to give ourselves a very hard look being Irish, and I own that, I'm Irish now, in terms of the unfairness of looking across the pond and how the children of our nationals can have access to that. But then even when we look at that, I think that the 27th Amendment and how it has been applied, I think it's such a hard rule because even the children who would qualify under this arbitrary, immoral and unjust system have it very hard to um, also maybe find a way like you you're going to have cases very hard cases like those of Colin and I do wonder how they're dealing with them so a child is born Irish because of the 27th amendment if for example they're a child of an Irish national what happens if that Irish national for example refuses to put their name on that child's birth certificate the other parent would have to go to court the other parent would have to get legal aid would have to go and seek um, a number of steps before they can even put that name on a birth certificate. Um, what happens if that person just disappears and doesn't, you know, even assist in that process? How do you prove that that person was Irish if that person, for example, was them, they were themselves adopted and you cannot even access their own public birth certificates? Um, what happens if that, another of the cases is, if a child is born to a refugee in Ireland, they're Irish by birth. What happens if that refugee for example, if there were if there was domestic violence in the house and that part and that person doesn't want to assist in the process, what happens if they emigrate as is their right to leave the island? So all of these children who technically meet the criteria to be Irish through the very hard lens of the 27th Amendment may not be able to effectively access that. So we have to, whenever we look at these hard rules, it's not only who that excludes, is excludes, but who, the people who should be included, but also because of all of these barriers and because we're making it harder, um, cannot access what they should, according to the law, have access to. Um, and I could rant about this for hours and, and how that affects them. And, and I think it's, it's just deeply, deeply worrying. And the children who are born after the 27th Amendment are going to be, what, 14, 15? They're going to be having their own children soon. And we have no way of stopping to have generations of people who were born in Ireland, one after the other, um, to actually be Irish 
and, and be recognized as Irish in paper as they are. Um, so yeah, that's my little rant on that. <laughs> Thank you, Mao. Uh, does anyone else wants to add on what she said or I can ask further questions? Okay, uh, so Bashir, I know that you are working now, as I said on the on the um, video there, that you are working on a research on citizenship, and I would like you uh, to tell me more about the levels of requirements uh, to apply for a decision citizenship, and in particular the good character one, the super citizenship, as as at his call. Yes, uh, I suppose that's moving uh, away from the practical. Um side of the issues that my young Colin uh, spoke so well about. Um, the legal conditions are, are just as problematic, mm -hmm. um, precisely because they come from a time uh, that's different to our time now, uh, and they, uh, they're in desperate need of reform. Um, but more specifically, because the conditions themselves are just uh, inconsistently applied, owing to the uh, absolute discretion of the minister, there's there's a lack of transparency in how those decisions are made. Uh, the people who make the decisions, uh, the good people of Tipperary, uh, where there's a uh, <laughs> there's not a, a, a large array of uh, ethnic uh, people of uh, uh, minority background. Um, <laughs> that's where the decisions are being made, for example. Uh, and there's um, even more specifically, the conditions themselves are not clearly defined. Um, we've no policy guidelines uh, on unlike many places in the EU. What is good character is the most popular one, for example, and we can talk about that, um, you know, forever, uh, but we'll come back to it. But there are all the other conditions as well, such as age, you have to be 18. But then uh, <laughs> being a full age uh, was defined as being 18, or if under 16, you're married. But uh, so far, there's no data, at least, suggesting that people, uh, uh, children coming from uh, third country nationals outside the EU, coming into Ireland, again married, just so they can uh, natural heist for citizenship. And so it goes to question again, you know, the, the understanding of the conditions that are there, because again, they were there without due consideration to the people who are going to be, it's going to apply. So that's, you know, that's even at the very basic level, such as age, good character will come back to. There's another issue of um, you have to have an intention to continuously reside. Sorry, I'm just looking at the conditions on my screen because I don't want to uh, paraphrase. I want to be specific uh, and says that you need to have an intention in good faith to continue to reside in the state after naturalization. And my question is, well, how do you measure an intent. Now there, you know, you can say, oh, well, this person has property here. So surely, you know, there's an intention or they have work here or they have relations here. But we're not told what the definition or what the confines of what an intention is. And I, I believe in the form it's just, yes, I do intend or no, I do not intend, mm -hmm. uh, which really isn't a choice, an option. Mm -hmm. It's either if you want naturalization, you have to intend. And if you don't, well then click the no. And so you, rather than an intention, it's really a demand that you have to stay here. Which again, if you look at that uh, in line with what section 19 says that if you do leave for more than seven years, your citizenship can be revoked. And to take those two together, that is a clear demand that you have to stay here, which is contrary to principles of international law and free movements. So that's a problem, uh, for example. Uh, uh, again, the reckonable residence, which I've always argued uh, could be a lifeline for undocumented people because reckonable residence is not defined. So we're not told, and uh, many of us, or some of us might understand that residence is a term, a concept that can be applied and has different legal meanings depending on, depending on the legal context. And so you have actual residence where you are physically in the country versus legal residence where there's legal documentation suggestion that you've been in the country. And so, uh, and then habitual residents and things like that. And so what we, what we can say is that the, because of the discretion of the minister, there is way to implement policies that says reckonable residents can also be construed as actual residents, given a lifeline to those undocumented people that have been here for years, 
uh, in the EU, uh, uh, integration requirements are only five years. If you reside in another EU member states after five years, you have permanent residency there. So there is a way uh, it, 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 if there is a political will, and there's just no political will, again, because it's a lack of diversity within our political structure. And so we don't have regards to those issues. Um, so good character, because that's the most uh, problematic, um, and it's the only one we actually have some clarity on in terms of case law. Um, and so there are some conditions. Uh, uh, basically, what we're told through the case law is that you mustn't come to the adverse attention of the Gardaí, uh, which can base, which basically, in, uh, in pedestrian language, is basically don't come to the attention of the Gardaí, either as a witness or what have you. Because mm -hmm. cases suggest that if you do come to the attention of the Gardaí, well, then you, your citizenship, uh, your naturalization application might be in jeopardy. How then are we supposed to uh, report hate crime? for example, when there is a fear that my naturalization application by coming to the attention of the Gardaí might be jeopardized. Now I know you're thinking that sounds far-fetched, but where there's lack of uh, information, where there's a lack of guidelines or trans a lack of transparency in how these decisions are made, what are our, what are our alternatives? Sorry, that's a lot tongue twister. And, uh, and that's where the problem lies. And I know the good character requirement is subject to uh, case law at the moment, uh, uh, is currently in the courts. Uh, but the problem is that we need clear guidelines from the minister in terms of how to uh, uh, clarify good character. It's very well done in other EU states. I mean, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from other EU member states where they say if you've been convicted in the last three years for you know, specific crimes or you know, for whatever, that that's you being of bad character. Other member states would say, if you don't pay your tax, that's bad character. But we don't have that. Even here in Ireland, morality has been subject to the good character qualifications in the case where uh, I think um, it was a polygamous marriage and uh, that was recognized as being of, essentially of being of bad character. And so where we don't have clear guidelines on what constitutes good character, when it can uh, come from simply being a victim of an incident uh, to, um, you know, uh, a, mor a moral, uh, um, you know, uh, conflict with the host morality, uh, public morality, that can become an issue as well. And so if we can get to uh, understand uh, what the clauses or the conditions for naturalization actually say by looking, and that's what my research does, and I look at it in depth and I compare it with that of the Netherlands and, Fran uh, and the French uh, in order to build lessons uh, that can be learned from them. And the biggest lesson I've learned is that we really, really need to transform or rather reform the Citizenship Act. For example, the biggest problem with that Citizenship Act is that it's called Irish nationality and citizenship which clearly suggests a difference where I talk about semi-citizenship, that if you are national, different rules applies. And if you're a citizen, different rules applies. And the basic, the biggest difference is that because you are a citizen, uh, true naturalization, you are a semi-citizen. Your citizenship is qualified, subject to the conditions contained in Article 19, which again is a little bit more obscure. Other than the, you know, uh, mistake on the documentation, everything else is a little bit uh, uh, um, uh, uh, complex. For example, one of the other requirements is that you must uh, make a declaration of fidelity to the nation and loyalty to the state, which is fine. It's a requirement from most major countries. Article nine of the Irish constitutions demands that very requirement from all citizens. However, only us have to make a declaration, but that's beyond the point. When you go to article 19, it says if you fail in your duty of loyalty to the state, uh, of uh, fidelity to the nation and loyalty to the state, but what does that even, what, what it, uh, constitutes failure, uh, which basically means you have to, uh, there's an act of fidelity, but we're not told what that act is. All we had to do was make a declaration, and we've done that at the citizenship ceremony. And so then what constitutes an act? Now, the case law, uh, the MASH, the only one really that we have, suggests that it, it involves issues to do with uh, public security or terrorism, to be more precise. Um, but that's the only evidence we have, that that's what constitutes a failure to fidelity to, to the nation and loyalty to the state. But there's not enough evidence to suggest that that's the only uh, failure of that act. And so we need clarity on what these laws means and the implications, because I am here and I've always said it, 
that uh, by law, by heart, boy, whatever, I am Irish and I'm here to stay. And there are many people, uh, those second generation migrants and first generation migrants alike, that feel the same way and are uh, equally citizens as per the constitutional requirements. And so ca can we really say that this is citizenship when we are at risk of losing that citizenship? And so we need instant reform. Now we're getting to that. The, uh, uh, the courts have already said that uh, the lack of uh, procedural guarantees deems it unconstitutional, but we need to go a little, we need to be brave enough uh, and to go against the international norm and say revocation is not okay if what we, uh, especially when the constitution prescribes that if you are a citizen, you are part of the nation. That's what article two, the second article, after the first article, which proclaims the sovereignty of the nation, and the second says that you are part of the Irish nation if you are born here or you are otherwise qualified in accordance with law. And once you're qualified, that you are part of the Irish nation and you shouldn't be able to uh, have your citizenship revoked. And that's the, the most fundamental reform that needs to occur because uh, uh, those undocumented or those children born who are now going to, uh, who are now Irish, um, you know, need that legal guarantee that we talked about at the very beginning. And the biggest legal guarantee is that you are protected. That, you know, if you identify as Irish and your passport proclaims that, then the, the law should certainly reflect that, hypothetical or not. So, yeah. Thank you, Bashir. Well, besides what you already said, do you have anything else to add in relation to the reforms that you would like to see? Because I would like to ask Maho, and calling uh, the same questions now we're approaching the q a time so um if uh, maho colin and bashir would like to tell me a few key points of the things of the key reforms that you would like to see in the system now uh, to apply for irish citizenship it will be great i i, I just <laughs> really just because i just uh, went on a long speech there um my key reform would be to provide guidelines. I think that would be a great starting point from the minister's department to provide guidelines for what these conditions mean so that people can relatively uh, 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 analyze their likelihood of success so that they don't invest huge sums of money and time uh, and resources uh, for an application which may not be successful either way. And so we need that clarity uh, and that clarity starts from guidelines and clearer uh, transpar uh, policy transparency. Thank you, Bashir. Can I add to, to what Bashir was saying in terms of, I think, in terms of citizenship through naturalization, we need, like you said, clarity on what is good character. It cannot be the same to be convicted of murder to a ticket, a traffic ticket. And we all know I care about those because I cycle. Uh, it, 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 you know, there has to be some graduation. There has to be some expectation. Oh, OK, I need to wait or this is, you know, definite. No, no. You know, it, it, it's just too out there we don't know there are no standards and, and I think it verges onto the point where what is discretion is turning into something that is arbitrary and that's really concerning because um, what something the department doesn't necessarily realize is that some of us look at our files and some of us are migrants and you, we share notes and we see what's happening and we see what I was asked for and what you were asked for in terms of even even documentary clarity and I think I want to bring up there was an article in the Dublin inquiry uh, inquirer on the 27th of January I invite everyone to read it about Emily um, whose citizenship application has been incredibly prolonged. Emily was asked after a year of applying for an FBI cl clearance and a good friend of mine gave me permission to talk about her own application. She applied. She never had to give same country, US American. She never had to give an FBI clearance. So what's the story here? Why are these people being asked for different documents? I have seen cases of people who transited before coming to Ireland, maybe spent a day or two here and there, and were asked for police clearances from those countries. And I wasn't myself asked about, you know, my two weeks in Cuba on holidays or when I was living in Colombia for, you know, like these are, and it's just why are some people asked for some things and not other people ask for the same? And it only leaves us guessing that it might be because of our nationality or because of our, the skin, or, you know, the color, the color of our skin and things like that. Beyond the naturalization, I think we need to, you know, the 27th amendment, we, you know, we don't need to repeal it right now. We can 
certainly improve the legislation so that children who are born here and could clearly belong here can have that security and that safety. And my third thing, and maybe that's something we can talk about later, is the foreign birth registry needs to be resourced and needs to be prioritised by the Department of Foreign Affairs. Children of Irish nationals who are being born abroad, you know, who can have a claim to citizenship in this country, the weights and the processes that they have to go through to access their right to have an Irish passport, uh, it's simply disappointing, what I would say, because I, I, I have really good experience with the DFA in issuing a passport in three days, but this one process has not been invested on. Um, and then the last thing, and it's not related to citizen, citizenship in itself, but I think we really, really need to look at policing. And I think, Bashir, you've talked about this in other, uh, in other venues. We have to take into consideration how not everyone is policed in the same way in this country. And it's not just about race and it's just not about migration. It is also about geography. It is also about class. It is also about some groups of people having higher contact with the police. Uh, for example, you have sex workers or people who live in certain areas who, because they come to the attention of the guards, then their probability of accessing citizenship is being diminished. So we have to talk about how that step that comes even before applying for citizenship affects people. And we need the data and we need the confidence that people are not being selectively or you know, selectively policed in this, in, in this country. And it, you know, as I said, it's not just about race, but race can definitely play a part in it. Thanks. Thank you, Maho. Uh, yeah, so just following up from Bashir and Maho, and Bashir talks eloquently about the uh, lack of clarity, lack of policy, lack of transparency within the uh, naturalization system. Uh, for a person who's worked in this area for a significant period of time, I can certainly attest to the uh, frustration that uh, migrant work, uh, you know, migrants and individuals working in this area have with the system that there is no policy, like there is a lack of transparency in a lot of areas uh, to do with uh, like naturalization, like character. Um, you know, there are inconsistencies there where, for example, uh, you may be, you may have a, a, road, um, a road traffic offense uh, from 10 years ago, but that you have to disclose that in your naturalization application. But me as a uh, Irish citizen born in this country uh, don't because of the Spent Convictions Act, where there is an, ex uh, an exemption in that act that I don't need to disclose it, but um, but everyone applying for naturalization, naturalization has to, and that can be used against them. Uh, just in general, in terms of uh, beyond naturalization, uh, there are, um, in, in the context of undocumented migrant children, a huge impact of the, of the 27th Amendment has left uh, numerous a huge swath of, uh, of, of children in this country uh, undocumented or just an, a, a serious lack of barrier to, uh, to naturalization. So labor, the Labour Party currently got a bill uh, before the doll in respect of um, introducing clear um, avenues for uh, pathways for, for young uh, children born in the state to qualify for naturalization. Uh, it's a very good bill in that sense. It doesn't introduce birthright citizenship, but it introduces a pathway to remove some of the barriers uh, for naturalization for children in the state. Um, again, because of that, because of the 27th and because of the immigra immigration policy that we have now is that everyone under the age of 16 is assumed to have the immigration status of the parent. So uh, on, a, you know, on a practical barrier, uh, practical basis, it is very hard to know what the policy is for the registration of minors when they turn 16, because on a day-to-day -day basis, there's baffling inconsistencies in, in, in the system. So introductions of bills like this, along with clear guidelines as to the immigration policy for young migrant children in this country would go a long way towards introducing a you know a clearer path uh, for for you know for children to become naturalized independent of their parents status or even just the introduction of uh, the reintroduction of birthright citizenship and everything but just as a you know an immigration practitioner Clear guidelines is one of the major barriers to even information-wise and for migrants knowing their rights in the state. Perfect. 
Thank you, Colin. So now we are on the Q&A time as uh, our located time for, for questions and answers. So uh, Teresa, I think is going to start reading the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Teresa Buczkowska. I'm the integration manager and my role now is to read the questions that we received through the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to read um, maybe the second question because the first was partially already answered by the speakers. And the second question says, for people from countries not recognizing dual citizenship, if they take up Irish citizenship, as a result, they lose their original nationality. If they lose Irish nationality, could they become stateless? Can I, can I just say that I'm in that situation because I lost my own citizenship when becoming Irish. It was, it was great fun. No, that, that was a joke. Um, I think it, this brings up another issue in terms of Ireland complying with it, it its international obligations. So normally um, Ireland shouldn't be removing citizenship when that means that the person is going to be stateless. However, in Ireland, we don't have a statelessness you know, determination procedure even though we have signed up to international conventions. So the answer is, you know, yes, no one should be stateless and Ireland should play no part and has committed to play no part in making people stateless. However, to date, we don't necessarily apply and implement the principles of those conventions that we have signed. And we haven't said, this is the procedure, these are the steps, these are the conditions for you to be, a, you know, De determined stateless and then access Irish citizenship. And that's another major gap because we do have people who are stateless in Ireland, but in order to reach that declaration, you know, a, a lot of them, I think they've had to settle in the high court. Uh, so we still have reached the point where we don't have a determination procedure. So normally, yes, that would be the case. Ireland shouldn't be playing part in making someone stateless, but we've made promises that we haven't necessarily um, implemented through having the mechanisms there in place. So, yeah. Thank you, Maho. The other question relates to the good character requirements and uh, at, uh, becoming uh, 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 coming to the attentions of the guards. Do you think that this might stop people from community activism because they will uh, not want to come to the attentions of the guard and becoming true uh, members of the community uh, through activism? I might, I might take a shot at this. Um, the point is not to come to the attention of the Gardaí. That's not your problem. In fact, you engaging in civic uh, engagements like that is what academics call good character requirements. Uh, that's what that's you being a good citizen. Uh, what what our actual good character requirements should actually be looking at, rather than you know coming to the adverse attention of the Gardaí. But the point is that coming to the attention of the Gardaí is a, uh, a legal issue that needs to be reformed uh, 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 by way of legislation or, or or through the courts or otherwise, whatever way it needs to be reformed, it needs to be reformed. So the problem is not you being a good citizen; it's the problem of a lack of definition. Uh, and clarity over the good character requirement. And so engaging in community activities like that is actually strongly recommended. And in fact, one of the uh, requirements in the form is for references, and it's only true uh, engaging in the community um, that you build a network of um, Irish people to give you reference for your application. And so, um, you know, we're all going to come to the attention of the Gardaí one way or another. Um, it's what the system, and that's the citizenship acquisition system, uh, does with that information that's uh, of importance. And that's the area we need to focus on, on how we, we need to uh, define what we mean by good character. Um, so if you're worried about uh, engaging in community, um, don't be worried. I, 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 it should stand in your favor. Um, but of course, again, that's at the absolute discretion of the minister. So. I and you say that it, the vagueness of it can have a chilling effect mm. and in my experience it has and even in my own personal experience you know like if you're doing sometimes part of civic and vague engagement is to go and protest is to go and do something and and I think I've myself been careful in terms of you know oh look you know I don't want to engage in this because then it can you know things can escalate into a public order offense um, and you know you know you just get slapped with a public order offense and that gets and you know so I think uh, rather, you know, like I would just be mindful and some people have said publicly that they don't feel like they can speak publicly um, 
and complain about the processes and the procedures of immigration because their citizenship is pending. That has never stopped me or others. Um, but but th those fears of, of those individuals are, I think, very valid because of the vagueness, the inbuilt vagueness of it. And that's something that has to be resolved. Thank you. The next question is more of a statement, so uh, perhaps you can comment on that. So it says, to remove barriers and promote uh, and maintain equality, I think all children of naturalized Irish citizen parents should be allowed to be Irish citizens automatically, regardless of their age or whether they were born in Ireland. I believe Irish families that have children abroad are automatically Irish. I think the um, Bashir might be able to uh, confirm, but in, on the on that point of uh, naturalized European citizens and children uh, are automatically entitled. I think France has has, has that uh, provision in their in their legislation that if you become a naturalized French citizen, the children are automatically uh, given French citizenship uh, too, and it is certainly something too uh, that should be considered in in Irish legislation. Okay. And we kind of have that and look at the system. And can I just say that the person is correct in terms of the child of an Irish citizen who was born abroad can access oh, yes. the citizenship. And that was the comment that I was making about resourcing appropriately the foreign birth registry unit within the Department of Foreign Affairs, because right now, even before the pandemic, it was taking 12 to 18 months to get something processed. And the barriers, and if it's okay to expand, the barriers for people to access a foreign birth registry are disproportionate to people from certain populations. So if you look at um, the guidelines for, um, they're very specific depending on the place. So for example, if a child is born in Bangladesh, and I'll give you an example, and, and I, I haven't gone through the rules recently, but I think it's still the case, that child has to, they, they have to wait the documents, but the documents have to be witnessed by someone who's in India. A Bangladeshi citizen needs a visa to get themselves into India, and then that has to be processed and sent to the embassy in India. Then the requirements in the embassy in Nigeria, and up until a couple of years, I'm not sure it's still the same, is that both of the parents had to present themselves to the embassy, even if one of them is here in Ireland. Um, to go and sign this document. So the, the disparity in the rules and even the spread or, of our embassies does end up in the fact that some children of Irish citizens have an easier way or harder way to access the citizenship that they are entitled um, through the registration in the foreign birth registry. And that is something that, and I, and I think I don't want to say that that was intentional or anything, but intentions has nothing to do with it. It is a policy and a practice. And um, a resourcing that has a disproportionate effect on, on children of naturalized migrants and children of emigrants. And that's something that we have to remember there. And that's my rant about the, the foreign birth registry. Sorry. I, I recently came across a similar one, Maho, where the uh, individual living in Dublin had to go to Afghanistan and then from Afghanistan, the closest Irish embassy in, is in Dubai. And yeah, procedural nightmare. Thank you. Thank you. And this question follows from the question about people who have to give up their original uh, citizenship when they're taking Irish citizenship. And the question says, should we look for expansion or permanent residence right as a solution for sole citizenship choices? Can, can, I, can I give my two cents on that? And I know I'm speaking too much. Um, it, we don't have permanent a residence in Ireland aside from family members of EU nationals. And that was one of the goals in the last integration strategy. And it was to have more stable long-term immigration options for people who, for whatever reason, cannot or do not want to access Irish citizenship, which, it, which is their right. Like you would see people for, from countries that don't accept dual nationality. That's something that we should have. And I don't know why we haven't had. And that has been in the migrant integration, integration strategy that has just ran out. Um, and I think there's a big question. We've said as a government, the previous government said that they would do something, uh, but we just haven't seen action. And I think that that should be there as an option because maybe not everyone wants to become Irish and that's okay. What we do have in, in practice is this is this uh, system called stamp five without condition as to time, which uh, uh, again, you know, in, uh, you 
if you've listened to this conversation, is, is relatively vague, which is in line with most other immigration aspects. Uh, uh, but in practice, so what it means is that if you if you've been legally resident in the state, unreckonable residence for a period of eight years, eight you qualify years. for effectively long term uh, unlimited residency rights. Uh, but you but have to pra- renew it. Every yeah, exactly. Period. And in they, the practice, they, keep, they keep checking the conditions and like the, it's you know. It's, so it's very it's, similar it's, than up to others, yeah. Yeah, it's it's in practice. It's supposed to be last as long as your passport, but each time your passport expires, you not be, you don't just go and get a new one. You have yeah. to reapply for it, and that leads to massive delays and gaps in residencies and and very vague conditions attached to it. Yeah, so absolutely. You mentioned the threat of deportation should you break those conditions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So citizenship does guarantee you, uh, you know, that legal security. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the word of the day. Of, thank you. There are more questions, but we are running out of time, unfortunately. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to pass it back to Angelisa for some closing remarks. Thank you. Unfortunately, our time is up now. Uh, but I would like to first thank you to our, thank to our panelists because this was a very uh, an excellent discussion and a great discussion about this topic. Uh, it's very clear from this talk that uh, citizenship matter because uh, equals to equality, permanency, identity, and also that the current system it is proven to have barriers. Um, to migrants to acquire uh, naturalization and that there is a high level of expectations, lack of transparency, uh, inequalities, there's no pathway for citizenship from for vulnerable migrants uh, and the current legal framework needs, needs to be reformed, especially uh, uh, clear guidance, uh, reforming the Citizenship Act no revocation, transparency in the system, and, and improve the legislation for children born in Ireland. So uh, those are some of the conclusions that, that we came up uh, here today. Thank you very much for, for this. And I also want to thank Immigrant Council of Ireland for this initiative, because I'm sure that this uh, type of, of platforms will then feed into policies that will improve the system, make, make a fair, Ireland and a more integrated and inclusive Ireland. And finally, I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow we have the final day uh, of the conference. Uh, we have two sessions in the afternoon, one at 2 p.m. and one at 6 p.m. And the 2 p.m. is about integration of EU migrants. And the last one is about representation through black uh, excellence. So thank you all, stay safe. And thank you again for, uh, to Maho, uh, Bashir and Colleen. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.